Have you ever wondered how everyday products from your smartphone to your car that billions of people use each and every day are precisely designed, brought to life, and sold? Lucky for you, I'll be breaking down the entire process through the lens of a mechanical engineer, from the initial spark of an idea to the moment a product hits the market. I'll also be sharing some valuable tips on how to avoid costly mistakes and make your designs feasible and manufacturable. There's also a game-changing tool, Jiga.io, that has entirely changed the way I design and make parts that I wanna share with you. So let's get started. Every great product starts with an idea. However, way before I'm mechanical engineering even gets to brainstorm and explore different ideas, high-level discussions take place within a company between key stakeholders and opinion leaders like the CEO, COO, and VPs. Keep in mind that engineers typically don't have a say in what new products a company will pursue. Engineers will come into the picture a bit later. Instead, it's a senior leader from the engineering department, such as the senior VP of hardware engineering, that will have a say in the very high-level product company concept, product vision, and what products the organization will ultimately offer to consumers. The same goes for marketing and industrial design. The VP of marketing and the head of hardware design will have a voice in the overall product offering for the current and subsequent years. For example, the iPhone 15, iPhone 15 Plus, iPhone 15 Pro, and the iPhone 15 Pro Max are what Apple's leadership decided the company would offer for the year 2023. This includes the product's overall dimensions, colors, surface finishes, storage, key features, and even materials. A lot of this will depend on a customer's needs, competitors, and business goals. Many times, we think that the mechanical engineer is the only individual who decides what material a product is made out of, but that's not necessarily true in many cases. Of course, this does depend a lot on the product and company as well. Let's just take the iPhone as an example because that's what I'm using. The iPhone 15 material is aluminum and the iPhone 15 Pro material is titanium. Now, I'm sure the decision by Apple to use these two materials wasn't as simple as a VP of engineering saying, a phone made out of aluminum and titanium will one, allow us to manufacture the phone and two, meet technical specifications like strength, weight, durability, heat dissipation, and corrosion. I'm sure marketing also had a huge say in it based on competition, consumer preferences, and brand positioning. Using titanium for the iPhone 15 Pro can reinforce its premium status, while aluminum for the iPhone 15 can position it as a more accessible option. The COO will also chime in and provide his or her input from a supply chain perspective that the materials are available and they require quantities and costs, the reliability of suppliers, as well as potential risks. Now that the company has decided what products will be offered, the industrial design team will work with marketing to come up with the ideal overall product dimensions. For the iPhone 15 and iPhone 15 Pro, it was 6.1 inches and 6.7 inches. The industrial design team will then create a digital surface or shrink wrap model representing the exterior shape of the product based on the requirements given by marketing. They will hand this surface model file, which is typically in step format, off to the mechanical engineering team who then imports it into their computer-aided design or CAD software like SOLIDWORKS, Creo, NX, Katia, or inventor. We'll reference this model to know how much space we have to work with and how big or small internal components need to be from the PCBs and cables to screw bosses and housings. I like to think of this as the starting point and when the work of a mechanical engineer truly begins. Of course, this assumes that the role is product design focused. Anyways, like humans, products have their own life cycle and go through four key stages in the market. Introduction, growth, maturity, and decline. Prior to these four stages, mechanical engineers primarily work in a development stage following the product development process, which I'll refer to from now on as the PD process. The PD process is pretty intricate and varies by company, but in general, there are five key stages. Conceptualization, design, validation and testing, product introduction, and manufacturing ramp. I'll be focusing on the design stage in this video. The design process is typically split into two parts, the high-level design 
design, and then the detail design. We will use CAD software, which is an essential tool used to generate 3D models of all the individual components, and from these 3D models, create 2D technical drawings that vendors use to make our parts. CAD is so important because it allows mechanical engineers to visualize the overall design, including interferences and collisions between parts, change and adjust dimensions and geometries on the fly, and output various file formats for different use cases like prototyping, numerical analysis, and PCB design. We begin with the high level design where the objective is to determine the overall dimensions, geometries, positions, and layout of key parts with relatively simple 3D models. Let's use a smartphone as an example. The high level design would further define the body's overall dimensions provided by the industrial designers along with an inexact placement of the screen, battery, motherboard, camera bump, as well as general layout of buttons and ports. A proof of concept that demonstrates the product's basic functionality, aesthetics, and ergonomics will then be built. Basic materials are chosen to conceptualize the feel and look. A metal or glass back of the phone might be considered without any detailed analysis at this stage. A combination of dummy components and actual components from previous products will be used for things like the buttons, the battery, motherboard, microphone, rear camera and front camera module, and electronic enclosures, and utilize a mixture of common materials like steel, glass, aluminum, ABS, and PLA, depending on specific project requirements, aesthetics, timing, and cost. The same goes for manufacturing methods. 3D printing, CNC machining, and other low volume processes can be used here since we are likely just making one to 10 proof of concept builds. Simple fastening methods like double-sided tape, adhesives, and standard off-the-shelf screws can be used to hold parts together without specifying exact locations. Most modern day products will involve electronics, optics, and software. So we'll talk with electrical, optical, and software engineers to gather any information we need to build the initial prototype. For example, electrical engineers can provide us with a populated PCB board that we integrate into our CAD model. Likewise, optical engineers can give us the model number and rough dimensions of the camera lenses and image sensors they wish to use. Now we begin to source all of the hardware, supplies, and custom parts to build our proof of concept. Speaking from personal experience, I can attest that engineering projects, whether personal or work-related, very often face tight deadlines and finding the right manufacturer or machine shop to make quality affordable parts fast is nearly impossible. That's why I highly recommend you to try out Jiga.io, the sponsor of today's video. Jiga is a unique custom parts manufacturing platform that connects you with a vast network of vetted suppliers, allowing you to directly communicate your requirements to them. This means you get parts faster, cheaper, and made exactly the way you want. With Jiga, you get to build relationship with suppliers, which not only makes the process more reliable, but also simplifies even the most intricate projects. Whether you need prototype or production parts, Jiga can do it all with its CNC machining, sheet metal, 3D printing, and plastic injection molding capabilities. Their platform is insanely user-friendly. All you need to do is upload your parts and Jiga will provide a quote within hours from multiple suppliers, allowing you to compare prices and lead times to get the best deal possible. What's even better is Jiga's service is fully transparent. You can directly communicate with the supplier for DFM feedback on Jiga's website and add notes to the 3D models to let them know your requirements. Recently, I needed a last minute custom part made for a personal project. I simply uploaded my CAD files to Jiga and literally within minutes, I got quotes from three different suppliers and received the parts in under a week. Jiga is also trusted by top tier companies like Google, NASA, and Flex. So you can be sure the quality and on-time delivery of your parts are guaranteed. So if you're looking to simplify and streamline your manufacturing sourcing and get parts much faster, definitely check out Jiga.io through the link in the description below. Now, once the proof of concept is built and showcased to all stakeholders, including leadership and possibly customers, and all parties have given the green light, we can kick off the detailed design. The design and materials of parts and sub-assemblies will inevitably change, evolve, and be optimized as we move throughout the PD process. And things like manufacturability, assembly, reliability, performance, and cost are considered. In this stage, we incorporate all the mechanical 
mechanical features of each component, including screw bosses, holes, slots, ribs, chamfers, fillets, grooves, and more into the 3D CAD models. In this stage, you will need to finalize the material for each component based on functional and technical specifications. For example, if the smartphone's button material needs to be corrosion resistant, have uniform color, impact resistant, wear resistant, fatigue resistant, machinable, and allow for coatings and finishes, we will need to leverage a systematic approach such as an Ashby chart to select the optimal material. Now, here's a small tip I have for any mechanical engineer. Involve your sourcing or purchasing department as well as vendors as early on in the design process as possible. You don't want to make the mistake of waiting too long to give them your part designs and have them tell you 10 part features can't be made and that the part needs to be redesigned with smaller undercuts and larger draft angles. You'll also need to check with your manufacturer, whether external or internal, whether all the parts can be assembled in the first place and if they can be assembled within the target cycle time. Committing these mistakes can massively delay delay a project and cause a huge chain reaction. For example, by adding a half degree larger draft angle on a plastic housing, it now collides with a mating part due to tight tolerances and the optical engineering team tells you that the draft angle will negatively affect the sensor performance. So the moral of the story is do not wait until your part designs have gone through too many iterations to get DFM feedback from your vendors. For each major design change you make, keep the vendor in the loop and ask for feedback. Don't be afraid to annoy them because that's their job. This also gives the vendor more time to make tooling changes and optimize their manufacturing processes to yield higher quality parts. It's also very important to stay organized, especially if the product you're working on has hundreds of thousands of parts, which very well could be the case. Each part will have its own part and drawing number that you pull from your company system. Each time you make design changes and send a drawing to a vendor for feedback, the drawing will be revved up, for example, from revision one to revision two, and it's the mechanical engineer's job to keep track of all of these changes. Not doing so could be or should I say will be catastrophic and things will get extremely messy. This is why it's important to navigate your company's product lifecycle management or PLM system and be familiar with the drawing approval processes in addition to others. A lot of times it's completely out of your control if the process workflow at your company is overly complicated or poorly designed. So just do your best. Now, essentially, I like to think of the detailed design phase as focusing on three bodies of work in parallel. The first area is of course part design. The second area is individual part manufacturing. And the third area is assembly of all the parts into sub-assemblies which are assembled to form the top level assembly. Of course part manufacturing and assembly can be combined depending on what your company's supply chain looks like. For instance, Foxconn carries out the majority of Apple's and other companies manufacturing operations. Other companies have multiple vendors that manufacture the individual components and sub-assemblies, and the final assembly of these components takes place in-house. A company that comes to mind is Boeing. Whatever the case may be, a common pitfall of inexperienced mechanical engineers is solely focusing on the design aspect, making sure that all components fit together in a CAD model, and completely neglecting manufacturing and assembly. Of course, you can rely on vendors to provide you with valuable DFMA feedback, but a seasoned mechanical engineer will have already applied DFMA principles to all the part designs long before they are sent off to vendors. It's important as a mechanical engineer to develop a habit of asking the right questions and envisioning the potential issues that could rear their ugly heads later down the road as you design parts. For example, some good questions that I like to ask myself are, can this undercut feature be made? If not, what are some workarounds? Should I use snap features or screws from an assembly and installation standpoint. Does this part need a loose or tight tolerance? Adding this hole will make assembly easier, but will it affect the performance? If so, by how much and can this trade-off be made? Asking the right questions frequently early on will definitely make your designs much more sound and make you a better engineer. All the best mechanical engineers that I've come across always think about optimizing their part designs for manufacturing. Develop a good understanding of DF 
FMA principles and avoid obvious things like sharp corners, overly tall and thin features, undercuts, non-uniform wall thickness, and deep holes if possible. Now aside from vendors and manufacturers, it's also important to stay on the same page with other engineering teams, including electrical, software, optical, manufacturing, quality, and testing. Designs are ever-changing, so you don't want to fall into the trap that I fell into of assuming that engineers will convey last-minute design changes to you because everyone is busy and has their own priorities. Ultimately, it's up to you to sync up with other engineers regularly. You never know if an electrical engineer has an extra component like a capacitor onto a printed circuit board that collides with another part or a quality engineer forgot to tell you that a critical dimension was identified to be out of spec during incoming quality control because he was too busy taking a dump. The same thing applies to project managers. Engineering projects follow a stringent schedule with key milestones and deadlines and involve tens of hundreds of individuals responsible for making a decision or completing a task. Project managers lead the charge and will have the latest inside scoop with regards to changes to the timeline and resources. Oftentimes, a project can be delayed if employees quit or people are moved onto another project. There are a lot of moving parts in a project, so as a mechanical engineer, we need to stay on top of things to design parts on time to specifications and within budget. It's also worth mentioning that most companies will have internal code names for projects and products, so keep that in mind. For example, when Tesla was designing the Cybertruck, I'm sure they didn't refer to it as that name within the company. Instead, they refer to it as something else like X Ash A12. Now, every mechanical engineering design role will be unique and come with other duties, but the focus of this video is design. Aside from CAD design, other things that mechanical engineers might do throughout the design phase of the PD process to decide between different design configurations, evaluate and improve designs, and eliminate risk include design of experiments, fair modes and effects analysis, gauge repeatability and reproducibility, tolerance analysis finite element analysis, and computational fluid dynamics simulations. Based on my experience, mechanical engineers, including myself, will leverage these tools as many times as they see fit throughout the entire PD process, whether it's early on in the conceptual design stage or late into the pre-production stage. I won't discuss these tools in this video, but feel free to check out my other videos through the link in the description below, where I talk more in detail about them. So to summarize, mechanical engineers don't get to decide what products a company ultimately pursues. However, once the executive leadership team approves the products, mechanical engineers have a tremendous and direct impact on the functionality, performance, reliability, manufacturability, and commercialization of these products and in turn play a huge part in a company's success or failure. Being aware of project requirements, deadlines, goals, and milestones and knowing when to do what to prevent delays and avoid obstacles are extremely important as a mechanical engineer. Frequent and effective communication with engineers, managers, vendors, and stakeholders is critical to effective design and project execution. Asking the right questions and always trying to apply DFMA principles to your designs will also make you a much more well-rounded engineer. Now, a lot of things that I mentioned in this video comes with working in industry and making mistakes. It's inevitable that all of us will make mistakes at some point in our career and life in general. And that's okay. Learn from them and become a better version of yourself each and every day. You'll quickly learn as a mechanical engineer in industry that there are some things you just can't control, so don't let them affect you. Instead, focus on the things that you can control and the things that we mentioned in this video, and I guarantee you that you'll have a blast and a lot of success designing things. All right, guys, that's it for today. As always, thank you so much for watching, and if you found this video helpful, be sure to check out my video here where I talk about my first six months as a mechanical engineer and some of the struggles I face. And I'll see you in the next one. Peace.